The Tom Woods Show, episode 841. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. If you don't yet have my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income, you are missing out. This is a how to guide how to podcast, how to self publish a book, how to monetize a blog, and so much more. So it's a how to guide, and it's also a how to monetize guide. It's both. Check it out at pathstoincome.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here, kicking off another week of episodes, and what a week it's going to be. Let me tell you what's coming up the next couple of days. Episode 842 is an episode I'm doing with Bob Murphy, and we're going to talk about what the correct response for libertarians, or what, not like you have to do what we say, right, but what we think the proper response ought to be to progressives who are suddenly concerned about limiting government. Are these sincere converts? And even if they're not, should we you know, needle them a little bit? Or wh what should be our correct response? And is, is there something wrong with saying, look, five minutes ago, you had no problem with the government doing X, Y, or Z. Is there anything wrong with doing that? Or is it actually a good idea to do that? Anyway, we're going to have a good discussion of that stuff uh, coming up uh, tomorrow, episode 842. Then two episodes from now, 843, the great Angelo Cotavia, who's absolutely brilliant. Everything you read by him changes the way you think. And I'm thrilled to have the chance to talk to him. That's going to be a do not miss. Well, today I'm talking to Robert Ringer, the multiple number one New York Times bestselling author of many books. One of them is his libertarian book, Restoring the American Dream. He's also written books aimed at people who want to succeed in business and in life. One of his best-selling books is Winning Through Intimidation, and then he followed that up with Looking Out for Number One and many other titles as well. He has appeared on The Tonight Show, Good Morning America, The Today Show, Nightline, and The Charlie Rose Show, as well as Fox News, Fox Business. He's been the subject of feature articles in major publications like Time Magazine, People Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, Fortune, Barron's, and The New York Times. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Tom. Happy to talk to you. You and I spoke on a program of your own some years ago, and I'm going to confess this to you right here. I did not tell you this before you came on, but at that time, I had read a few of your columns, and I thought, okay, this guy's a pretty good free market commentator. I like this guy. I didn't realize until I kept seeing your name coming up in reference to people who are really top-notch business thinkers, that that's kind of your area. People were saying, yeah, you know, gurus and experts like, and I kept seeing Robert Ringer come up, and I thought, what a dope I was talking to this guy. I had no idea who I was talking to. Now I do, years later. Now I know I was talking to Robert Ringer. So I want to talk about a lot of things. I want to talk about uh, current events and stuff and, and what you think about them. But also, uh, you know, I want to talk about winning through intimidation and, and your, your fun business-related stuff. So you ready? All right, I'm ready. Okay. First of all, you have a book. Tell me the history of this book. I think it is published under two different titles now, and it's called Winning Through Intimidation. What's the story behind that? Oh, it's too long to tell here, but uh, in 1973, uh, I started writing the book, and uh, I presented an outline, and then it ultimately presented the uh, entire manuscript to 23 publishers, uh, all of which rejected it or didn't answer me, which is an old story. If you want to find out whether your book or your manuscript is worthwhile, the last people in the world you want to talk to are, are uh, publishers, particularly mainstream publishers. So make a very, very long story short, it got rejected by 23 publishers. I knew nothing about marketing, nothing about uh, ad uh, copywriting. And uh, I just kept doing draft after draft and I started running ads. The first ads I ran, I think, was in, uh, oh, where was it, San Antonio. Then I ran one somewhere in the state of Washington, and they were a disaster. And I tried Time Magazine and, and People and so forth. And the long story is that I finally found a, a, an ad that worked, and before computers were even around, I developed a system for estimating based on the first days returns after I'd run an ad 
how many uh, orders I could expect after three days, five days, 10 days, 30 days. And it was amazingly accurate. I was doing it by hand with a with a pencil in a, in a notebook, and I, I made up uh, columns with a ruler. And anyway, went along like that for about a year and a half. And then uh, one day, um, at, at that time, maybe before your time, the, the most prestigious bookstore in New York City and uh, had branches in uh, other places like L.A. and New Orleans was Brentano's. Do you uh, remember Brentano's at all? I'm sorry, I don't, no. So I had this big flagship store on Fifth Avenue, and uh, it was like really prestigious. And I get a call one day from a woman who said she's the marketing uh, vice president of uh, Brentano's. And uh, she said, she actually said this. She was a very uh, uh, funny woman uh, by the name of Lillian Freeman. She said, how would you like me to put your name in lights? And uh, she said, if you will send me, if you, if you will let me run your, if you will run a full page ad, and I, actually I jumped ahead of myself. The way I started making it successful is I started running full page ads in the Wall Street Journal and then eventually started going to major newspapers across the country. And the ones in Wall Street Journal worked exceptionally good, so good that uh, running them for two years or more, uh, I never had an ad that didn't make money. And that was selling a $10 book. So uh, she said, if you run a full page ads for us, we'll buy your book. And she bought enough books to fill both windows right on Fifth Avenue, right near, near Trump Tower. It uh, wasn't there at the time. And um, the thing just, and I ran a full page ad for in the uh, New York edition of the Wall Street Journal. And I think the New York Times book absolutely exploded. And from that point on, Walden Book, which was the biggest at that time, uh, you probably remember them. I do. And B. Dalton, um, which I guess they've disappeared. And I think they were bought by, uh, by uh, Barnes & Noble. And that was it. And the book just took off. And then, and then somebody uh, called me from a little company by the name of uh, Thomas Crowell, uh, who later was bought by Harper and Rhodes, later became Harper uh, Collins. And they said they'd like to distribute the book. And I signed a distribution deal with them on July 2nd, 1974, 1975. And, uh, they put it in bookstores across the country starting in September. And in about two weeks, it was like number three on the Time Magazine bestseller list and three weeks on the New York Times list. And eventually became a New York Times number one bestseller. That's a very abbreviated version, but uh, that, that was the long and short of it. Along the way, I made a uh, what at the time was a huge deal for me, which I use in speeches, the story of how I made the deal with Fawcett Books, which was later bought by Ballantyne, which was later bought by the uh, name of the company. So it's the biggest company. And that really just made the thing explode. And of course, then we went on to looking out for number one. And and uh, that became a bigger number one bestseller. And uh, I basically did it all by myself. Like like the guy said, I, I was going down this alley and there was a bunch of thugs in the alley and I was screaming for help and nobody came. So I had to do it myself. I beat them all up and came out the other end of the alley. So it's uh, it's it it gave me some great stories to tell when I'm speaking to you know audiences. Well, so winning through intimidation that was your breakthrough book then. Right, absolutely. It was the first book I had ever written. I I had no idea what I was doing. I, I always got good grades in English in school, uh, and people used to say to me all the time, "You ought to write a book. You ought to write a book." And that was a time in my life when uh, I had just, I had been in the real estate business and created quite a stir. Uh, and uh, I had a Learjet uh, at those times, in, uh, in those times it was a big deal. Now uh, you can put it in the back of Trump's plane. Uh, but it was a big deal and the plane crashed and I survived and, and had, but it created all kinds of financial problems. And so I said, well, I'll just write a book about my experiences because everybody says I never heard anybody of anybody who's done what you've done in real estate. I was basically uh, uh, Century 21 or Marcus and Millichap before they, were, before they even existed. I, I was there in, uh, in the late 60s. 
And so that's what the book is about. It's an autobiographical story of my experiences in real estate. It was way ahead of the art of the deal. I, I assume that Trump, he, he would have had to have read my book. I've never talked to him. But, you know, he was the premier wheeler and dealer entrepreneur in New York City, and I was running full-page ads in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, so he had to see it, and he, there's no way he couldn't have bought it. But uh, so he's kind of Robert Ringer times, times a million because he took it to levels that were way beyond anything. But, but I, could, I could see, I just got through reading his book again a couple of weeks ago, and I could actually see some of the same strategies, but his also is autobiographical. You've probably read it. And, uh, but he, he was dealing on a level that I couldn't have conceived of, even though by coincidence, uh, my first deal, big deal and his first big, well, I don't know whether he called his first big deal. He's working for his father, but they were bo both happened by coincidence to be in Cincinnati. So it's kind of a strange world. And here we are today and he's the biggest name on the planet. Indeed. Now let's, I want to get into some of the ideas in these books. First of all, Looking out for number one, which was a which was later, that book is classified as a motivational book, and I want you to do something to redeem the genre of motivational books in my eyes because I feel like most of the time I pick them up, they're just a lot of fluff and it's just a pep talk and right. those those last five seconds, and then you go back into your normal routine. How is what you're doing different from that? I can't stand this genre, right. but I'm sure what you do is good. So tell me what's going on. No, I can't stand the genre either. In fact, it, it, I remember at one point, so I did a lot of television in those days, and it, uh, I remember I was on a show with, uh, uh, I don't know if you know who Michael Court is, but he was the editor-in-chief of Simon & Schuster for years and years and years. And he had a book called Power, and then a guy named Wayne, Wayne Dyer had a book called Your Erroneous Zones, and we were all on a show together. And I remember, I forgot who, it's some famous host, but I can't remember his name. And he said, well, it sounds to me like you, you, you guys all sound just, just about the same. And that really upset me. And I made a commitment that I was never going to appear on any show with either of them again, because I felt what my book was saying was almost the exact opposite of what your normal rah-rah uh, self-help books say. It, it, it was... It was totally different. It was, and I used in those days. I was a lot younger, so I used a little of the what what today the liberals like to use when they're expressing themselves. And uh, so I used a little foul language in it. But basically, I was saying that all the stuff that you have been led to believe is what makes you successful is BS. That was that was the and and so what I think my readers liked about me, and I think. The ones who are still around still like even in politics is that I don't I don't uh, I don't hesitate you know I was guess I guess I was kind of a miniature Donald Trump in that respect I well give me some examples I mean people we want to get into the meat of what you're talking about give me examples of what, what's some bad advice people might be given that sounds like good advice well I remember once early in in the um, early in the book and uh, as we're speaking here I'm, I'm pulling the book up now uh, early in the book, I said, made a statement that I had this mentor when uh, I was very young, and uh, he was an insurance agent at an agency, and he, and he was a very wise sage, you know, kind of a modern-day Socrates or Aristotle, Plato. And he said, it's been my experience that uh, most successful people, what they preach to their audiences, and that would be all, all of your self-help and motivational books, they don't know themselves the truth about what makes them successful. So they just preach the same old rah-rah, you know, philosophy, positive mental attitude, have goals. I've, I've never really had a goal in my life, but many, many, you know, people, probably thousands have written books on goals. So I kind of broke all the, uh, I, I, I broke the whole, the whole structure. And uh, most of the things I said in there, and I, I was emphasizing, and um, uh, I had the book was based on uh, my alter ego known as the tortoise. I, I don't know whether you've ever seen any of my books or not, but the tortoise is my alter ego. And he was kind of symbolic, and, and I 
I was the tortoise in my books because the tortoise is symbolically the guy who plods along, the hare gets a fast start, stops to rest along the way, but the tortoise keeps going and in the end he wins. So I had these theories throughout the book, theories in quotes, they're really tongue in cheek, but for example, the tortoise and hare theory is it's <clears throat> it's not so important where you um, it's not important how fast you get out of the, out of the starting blocks. It's where you are when the race is over, and little isms like that that uh, seem to strike a bell with people. I think to me the key part of this story, the interesting thing, is not only your first book is a smash success, but you were writing the ads. Now people go to school and they study to learn how to do things like that, and there are certain tips and rules and and the things you're supposed to do in ad copy. Did you read any books about advertising copy? Did you learn from the experts? How did you do that? I actually did. The two most important books I read were um, Ogilvy, Confessions of an Advertising Man, and another guy uh, in the early uh, 20th century. His name slips my mind now, but I'll get it before we're off the phone. And um, And I really heeded what they had to say. But most important... Uh, I lived in L.A. at the time, and there was a guy by the name of Joe Carbo. I don't know if you know him. He's an advertising marketing legend. And he was running these full-page ads on the uh, front page of the classified section of the L.A. Times. And the headline said, uh, most people are too busy earning a living to make any money. And he had this little paperback book, cost him 50 cents to print up, called The Lazy Man's Way to Riches. And he sold it himself. It's a little paperback, cost him 50 cents to make up. And he was selling it for $10. And he was running it over and over and over. And uh, it was obvious to me he must be making money or he wouldn't keep running the ad. So uh, being the uh, persistent, resourceful young man I was, I tracked him down. And he was kind enough to see me. And we actually, he became a mentor to me. And I kind of patterned myself after what he did, although my ad, my book was completely different. And I started experimenting with ads. And as I said earlier, the first uh, several, uh, more than several, were total disasters. I remember the first ad I ran, San Antonio Express, cost like uh, $1,300 and brought in $300. So I knew that wasn't going to last very long. But ultimately, I I, uh, started writing ads that worked. And I I went to full page ads and started running in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, I think the turning point for me was a headline that said, what's all the commotion about? And without having any professional, uh, you know, real professional knowledge or education, uh, I was kind of always kind of a psychologist, even when I was a kid. And it just seemed to me that what I had to do, uh, since nobody knew who I was, is I developed a strategy called the um, preconceived uh, notion of making you bigger than you are. So I wanted people to think something big was going on. So they were seeing these ads run every week in the Wall Street Journal, these full page ads. And um, then all of a sudden they see what's all the commotion about. And I had testimonials because I was getting tons of mail from people. Uh, but, you know, I'm more interested in what did you learn from these guys? Like, what are the things that you learned about the science of selling something? That, to me, is the interesting thing. What are you gleaning from this, especially given that you're brand new at it? That, how did you go from being lousy to being good? Well, in mine was trial and error. I kept doing the wrong thing, the wrong thing. One of the uh, rules I violated, I think it was Ogilvy's rule, is when you're asking people for money, it's serious business and you don't joke around and you don't try to be funny. That's a huge mistake that a lot of people make. And uh, I think my first ad was uh, an open letter to Howard Hughes, who was all the rage at the time. And it was really, looking back on it, it's really embarrassing. Now, I sell, a, sell a, a, a program now called Million Dollar Ads and I actually share with people, I actually, uh, as part of the uh, program, they get PDFs of all of my, uh, or some of uh, a great deal of my most successful ads. And I also sell them, send them some of my most unsuccessful ads, and I talk them through it and tell them why it was unsuccessful. 
So right out of the starting bat, it was unsuccessful because it was stupid. It's kind of embarrassing now, but at the time I thought, oh, I'll be real clever. I'll get people's attention. And I see that on the internet all the time now, and it's, it's kind of a turnoff to me. So that was one rule that I learned very early on, that when you're asking people to send, and in those days you were sending in a check, you're asking people to uh, send you money, it's serious business, and all they're interested in is knowing how you're going to make their life better. Are they going to take off weight, uh, better sex life, money, immortality, whatever, but they wanted to know what you were going to do for them. And at that time, I had no name. In fact, the picture of the book that I used to run in the ads, my name was so small, nobody could even read it, which is, I did that on purpose because nobody knew who I was. Now, later, it was totally different. I, I featured my name. But it's what you're going to do for the person. I think probably most professional marketers, successful ones, would agree. That's by far the single biggest, most important thing that uh, you can do when writing ad copy. I don't know if you know uh, Ben Settle, who's sort of a young, younger uh, email marketing guy, and he gets impatient with young copywriters who think that what they need to do is learn the latest ninja tactics from some guru online. Like, right. And they, they think there are these five steps, like identify the problem, agitate the problem, promote your – and it's just a cookie-cutter approach. And Ben says, well, it's not like there's no room for that, but if you know your audience, those things will fall into place. If you know who they are, what their pain is, and how you can – fix that pain, that's more important than all the little, the latest little tactics you're going to find uh, from some guru somewhere. Right. And yeah, I, I'm kind of turned off by most of, of what I see on the internet. Uh, some of these young guys would have you believe they're, especially when they make, you know, ridiculous uh, promises. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, the advertisements on television that basically are saying you can eat pizza and ice cream and anything and you're going to take off 50 pounds. And there's something called common sense and just, just common sense tells me that's totally preposterous. So you really have to be careful when you advertise. I think probably the best ads that I've ever run and, and ads I've seen that I really like are when you just sound like you're talking to the person saying, look, I know this and this and that. And Carbo used to say, if you're trying to sell them a Cadillac, beat them to the punch and bring up something like, oh, by the way, I have to tell you, there's one uh, negative thing about this car that I don't like, in all honesty, and you're on the edge of your seat. Oh, geez, what's he going to tell me? And he says something like, well, it has a small glove compartment. And it's a really cute trick because the person thinks, oh, shit, I can put up with that. So it's really psychology. There's just a lot of psychology uh, involved, and I think, Maybe people are born with it. I don't know. I've, like I said, even when I was a kid, I felt like I really understood people and what makes them tick. There are some things that come naturally to me when I'm writing, in effect, ad copy. But there are other things I wouldn't have thought of unless somebody had told me. Like you don't just sit there and say, this product is so great. Look at all the things it can do. Yeah. You instead – Try and transport yourself into that guy's mind. Get into storytelling mode. Tell a story that he can imagine himself in. You know, you've got this problem, and doggone it, it leads to all these other frustrations. And then, then you talk about your product as the solution. Not about the product, really, but about his beautiful lawn that he'll have. Not about your product that can cut the grass in a certain way. Right. But think about him. Keep him front and center. It's easy to miss that because you think, I have this great product. I can't wait to tell everybody about all the things it does. It's amazing, all the things it does. You can eventually sort of get to that. But you have to understand that it, that takes that's a takes a back seat to how you're going to fix this guy's problem. Now, tell me if you think any of the business ideas that – or let's say avenues to success or avenues to successful copywriting – any of this stuff that you've identified over the years, how much of that can and cannot be transferred to the Internet? Um, that's a tough question, Tom. Uh, I think the same, you know, psychology, things are the same today. Uh, the things that, uh, that, that, that Jesus and, and Confucius and Socrates and Plato and 2,000 years ago, it's the same today because human nature never changes. That's the real key. 
human nature never changes. So the same people still want the same things. And uh, that's what politicians are always appealing to people's uh, greed. You know, it's a, I'm going to show you how you can get a big, bigger piece of the pie. I'll steal from your neighbor and I'll give more to you uh, than my opponent will give. So I think that the psychology transfers to the Internet. Now, there are lots, obviously, lots of technical things going on that have made it a more challenging game. And uh, I have mixed feelings about the Internet. On the one thing, it's wonderful uh, to be able to push a button and you can go out to thousands or in some cases millions of people very quickly. But on the other hand, there's so much noise out there that it's very hard to get noticed today. And I didn't appreciate it at the time, but because I was running full page ads in newspapers across the country, I think 43 major newspapers, and especially the Wall Street Journal, it was so shocking to people at that time. They had never seen a full page ad for a book. So I think I took it for granted, which is something you're inclined to do when, you're, when you have youth. And, uh, and I thought it would always be that way. Now, that's what led me to start publishing other authors' books. And uh, as you may know, uh, I started that in 1980. And my very first book I published was a book that had sold about 10,000 copies uh, that this unknown author had written. And the publisher had kind of put it to bed. And uh, I made a deal with him and got the, got the rights and re-edited it and started running full-page ads. And it became... The, it was on. It was it jumped almost immediately to number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and was uh, in the number one position for 15 consecutive weeks, and became the uh, biggest selling hardcover book of 1980. A book called Crisis Investing by uh, Doug Casey, whose name you probably know today. Oh, sure, he's been on here several times. Oh yeah, well, Doug will tell you all about it. I, I sort of people joke that I invented Doug Casey because at the time he was just a young, uh, a pretty young man. And uh, I uh, I met him through a mutual friend of ours uh, who unfortunately passed away. Actually, he was my best friend, a fellow named John Pugsley. I don't know whether you ever heard of John or not. And, uh, and he introduced us and I agreed to publish his book. And it became uh, just an enormous, bigger success really in, in terms of numbers than any of my books had been. And that kind of, I think, kicked off his career. All right. Wrapping up, you've got books called Winning Through Intimidation, Looking Out for Number One, Million Dollar Habits, Action, Nothing Happens Until Something Moves, Getting What You Want. So you've written a lot of books with themes like this. And I want people to be able to walk away from hearing you saying, well, here are three specific things I learned that maybe run a little bit counter to the conventional wisdom, but that are actionable that I can walk away with. And then maybe, you know, maybe they read some of your books. But give me in bullet point, lightning round fashion, three things that are absolute necessities for success that most people maybe don't know about or haven't thought of. Oh, that's pretty rough, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'm, I'll, I'm sure I'll, I'll leave out 100 good points. Uh, I would say rule number one is... Uh, if you see a line, don't get in it. Um, that's probably the single most important thing. And what we're seeing in the Trump phenomenon is a classic example of that if, if you're doing things the conventional way, you're probably, probably making a big mistake. Another thing that comes to my mind, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, is I learned a little too slowly over the years that no matter how good the deal Never, ever, ever get involved with anyone if you have reservations about their honesty, their character, or something just doesn't feel right. Um, I feel that life can be so great if you're involved almost exclusively with really good people, uh, nice people, people you feel good about, people who, who uh, support your ideas. And uh, the other thing that comes to my mind is something that is more traditional, uh, but it's all in how you go about it. And that is never being, allowing yourself to be uh, dissuaded 
from doing what you want to do by people who I refer to in Winning Through Intimidation as the discouragement fraternity. You will never, ever, ever have a problem finding people uh, close by who will tell you all the reasons why you can't do something. And uh, any successful entrepreneur knows that uh, that should be a trigger to just motivate you to go do it anyway. Uh, I'm not saying if you try and try and try and you come up and you see with your own eyes there's reasons why it won't, what your business model doesn't work, either change the business model or you go on to something else, but never uh, allow negative. The best thing you do is not allow negative people into your life because, uh, again, this, this last uh, presidential election, uh, I think people are missing the biggest story. And the biggest story is how inspirational it is. Forget whether you hate Donald Trump or love Donald Trump. Forget Donald Trump. What he did is incredibly inspirational. Probably number one in the world uh, next to Jesus that nobody's ever made an impact and become the most famous person in the world uh, because he stuck to what he believed in. And all those poor people who laughed at him, I don't, they seem to have a lot of tears right now. So stick with what you believe in. Don't, and never get in a line. Don't don't do things the conventional way. Don't let anybody put you in a mold. All right. And with that, we're going to say goodbye. But I'm going to, of course, urge people to check out robertringer.com, which I will also link to at tomwoods.com slash 841, where I'll have uh, several of your books that we've talked about here uh, linked. And I'm glad we were able to catch up after probably five years since I last spoke to you. And I, pr- I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. All right, that's it for today. Juicy episodes coming up, at least the next two days. I can definitely promise you that, and probably even beyond that. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.